UCD has a particular focus on equality, diversity and inclusion. So we, we've come together with Molly, the Museum of Literature Ireland, in this project called Past, Present and Pride. It's a, it's a way for us to, to work with, to interview, to hear the voices of LGBTI writers um, Irish writers and perhaps some international writers, a way to give voice to, to the LGBTI experience to advance um, issues of, of diversity, inclusion and equality. I'm Paul Dalton, I'm a clinical psychologist, um, I work in UCD and I also work in, in St Vincent's uh, Hospital in Allen Park. Today I have the, the great pleasure to meet to, and to introduce you to Mary Dorsey. Mary, a poet, novelist and activist. Uh, Mary worked in UCD for many years and, and subsequently in, in Trinity. So, um, Mary, a very, a very warm welcome to past, present and pride. This, this project we are, are doing in collaboration with uh, Equality and Diversity in UCD and our colleagues and friends here in Mali, the Museum of Literature Ireland. Um, we're in Newman House, where UCD began its life in 1854. So welcome back to UCD. Thank you. Mary, a poet, <laughs> A novelist, activist. You were born in Dublin in 1950. You've taught in UCD and subsequently in, in Trinity. And you've published six collections of poetry, a novel and a collection of short stories. You are a founder member of the Irish Women, Irish Women United, Women for Radical Change, and the Movement for Sexual Liberation. Mary, of those three descriptions, poet, novelist, activist, which one captures you best now? I don't think I can separate them. I often think about that and I think, you know, if I hadn't been a writer, I would have been an activist too. And if I hadn't been an activist, I would have been a writer. Mm. So I, mm. I, they're, they're really interwoven and they're very deep in me. I suppose the writing, the love of literature started before the love of politics. You know, as a small mm. child, I wasn't interested in politics, uh, whereas I was passionate from the earliest years I can remember about you, literature. Li literature and, and activism. And they're, they're kind of, their they're intersectionality. They're, yes. they're, yeah, yes. you've, you've really lived that. You've lived that, that intersectionality, that kind of non-binary divide yes. between, between activism yes. and, and literature. To t tell us more about that. Why? Well, it's a long story. I have to go right back to my childhood. Uh, I was the youngest of five and my father and mother both were great readers and the house was always full of books. And I would be excited every evening waiting for my father to come home because after tea, he would read to us. And he read to the three younger ones. So the older brother, you know, the youngest of the three brothers, but the um, older than my sister and I, he would have been, I suppose, 10 or so. And I would have been maybe three or four. And then the sister in the middle would have been five. So he read for a book suitable for each of us. So I had nursery rhymes and so on, you know. Mm. And then my brother had Dickens and Robert Louis Stevenson and all these wonderful mm. writers, uh, Jules mm. Verne, you know. And I can remember clearly my father's voice reading those, those stories. Mm. I can remember being terrified by great expectations. Mm. I've never read it since because I got such a fright, you know, the opening <laughs> great expectations. It's one book of Dickens I haven't been able to read mm. since. So... My father died when I was seven and life changed very much. But the love of literature and the love of reading went on. And I actually couldn't read when he died. I didn't know how to read because I, you know, I loved being read to so yeah. much. I didn't see the point. Yeah. And then my mother just didn't have the time. 
Yeah. And that was the first time I was conscious of the difference between men and women's roles. She said, I can't, you know, yeah. I'd love to, but I can't. Yeah. And then she tried to do it a little bit during tea. And I said, oh, you're not doing the voices right, you know, because <laughs> my father oh. would do all drama. Yeah. yeah. And she didn't have time because yeah. she was a woman and she was hurrying, you know. And so, of course, I had to very quickly learn to read myself so that I could. And from the moment I began to read, I just embarked on on really on world literature. I don't remember a stage. I went straight from sort of infancy into adolescence. Mm. You know, I skipped a couple of stages. And is it is it um, am, am I right in understanding this that your your brother, one of your brothers, yes. went to the UK to to study, and um, he he brought books that were banned in Ireland yes. home. I mean, the the Kate yes. O'Brien, yes. Edna O'Brien, the James yes. Joyce. Is that he, well, he, almost right, yes. I had three older brothers. Um, my sister was next in line and then three older brothers. And Donal was the middle one, Donal Dorsey. And he actually was, sadly, he is no longer with us. Died a few years ago, but he worked on the Irish Times for years. So he was a journalist, very well known in Ireland. But as a young man, he was studying at UCD. And everything was banned in those days. That was mm -hmm. the 60s. Everything was banned. I mean, the whole of English literature... A lot of people know that Joyce was banned and Oscar mm. Wilde was banned. Everything was banned. Mm. And at that time, students, and they were mostly young men, all went to work in England in the summer, you know, mm. in factories. I think he went to a pea factory every year in some awful right. place, Hull or somewhere. <laughs> and he'd come <laughs> home. Other people came home probably with book, you know, casefuls of porn or whatever. But he came home with world literature. Yeah. And he just spill open this case on his bed. So he was studying, you know, those three-year course, arts course. My father was a mathematician and he had always wanted Donald to do maths, but Donald had this great love of literature, so went against it. But um, I would go up to his bedroom because it was the only place that was warm at that time, because he was allowed to have extra heat in his bedroom, you know, because he was a serious student. So I'd lie on the bed and to keep me quiet, he'd just hurl books at me. <laughs> so from 10 to 13, I was sort of hothoused by him. I see that in retrospect. Mm, mm. At the time, I just mm. you know, took it for granted. And mm. he would literally throw books <laughs> onto the bed and say, read page 10, you know, <laughs> read page 50. So I read Oscar Wilde, I read G.H. Lawrence, I read James Joyce, I read Steinbeck, all marked out by him. And then we discussed them afterwards. Mm. Extraordinary. And I think for some people... Mary, the idea that that, that Ireland um, of of censorship um, would, I, I think, would come almost as a surprise. You know that, it, and yes. as you say, it wasn't just yes. James Joyce. You yes. know, what well, I'm wondering about growing up in that kind of an yes. Ireland as a uh, as as a young girl, yes, as a teenager. What? How did it shape you? Well, do you know, it's very hard to describe to people who haven't lived through it because, as you can probably imagine, knowing Ireland, there's always, there's, there's always more than one reality going on. <laughs> I remember when I was travelling a lot in the 80s when I first began to publish and I'd be going to countries, you know, here, there and everywhere. And uh, a lot of people would assume that you were either completely repressed in Ireland and it was like a, a jail sentence to live there or they would think you were just like the rest of Europe, you know, rich and educated and liberal. And it was very, very difficult to describe the in-between world that we lived in. Mm. So growing up, I was mm. conscious of that repression, of course, and I was conscious of the class distinctions, the poverty. There was such obvious poverty everywhere you went. And, you know, the church going on a Sunday, you had to go to Mass on a Sunday. I remember my brother, the same brother who was studying at UCD, uh, skipping Mass and going to the local pub and telling me, I was the only one who knew that's what he was doing. And then he told me, oh, we all do that. You know, all the guys do that. We just go across the road. You know, we put a face in at the door and then we go to the pub. And I stopped going to mass when I was, I think, 13 or something. I was very rebellious. Did you? At 13? Yes. yes. And I was also, you know, very, very passionate about it all. And I explained to my mother, I remember with tears in my eyes because I'd become totally cynical about the Catholic Church, shocked by them. I'd been overeducated, you see, by the brother. I knew all about the persecutions yeah. and the terrible tyranny of the Catholic Church. And I said, I'm going to be a Protestant, you know. <laughs> so I'm still a Christian, I believe. I read the Bible, you know, and I became an expert <laughs> on the Bible briefly and actually won the... There was a national religious competition in those days. 
and we all had to do a compulsory exam. Maybe it was, I don't know if it was just for <laughs> convent schools. But anyway, I, I got first marks and my mother was almost fainted when she heard she couldn't understand how this could possibly have happened, <laughs> you know, to this. And, and I mean, does it linger? Do, do that influence, those very strong influences at an early age, are they with you still? Yes, it's, it formed my radicalism. I was conscious always, as I am to this day, it's, it's very hard for me to describe one or other reality, because for me there's always dark and light present. So I actually, I think, could say I lived in a paradise until my father's death. And then things changed hugely. And that was my first experience of complete change. That I learned, I think, that the worst can happen. I think that's what I, I learned at an early <clears> age. <throat> and in some ways then, there were always moments with my friends I'd be cut off from them because they were more childish than me. They had a mm. naivety. They didn't know the worst could happen. Yeah. They were still living in that happy place yeah. where if your parents said everything's going to be all right, it would be all right. Yeah. But I had been told my father would be all right and he wasn't, you know. Yeah. So certainly that marked me. Yeah. But I was having such a wonderful life. I had such fun at school. I had wonderful friends. Yeah. Immediately after my father's death, I, I moved from kindergarten to the you know, secondary primary school. Yeah and had wonderful friends there. And this is crucial to always, I talk about this, we lived right beside the sea. And it was still an old, this was Dorky, you know, South County Dublin, but it was a wild place in those days. And there was an old style fishing community who could have been in Connemara, you know, right. men in long black coats with caps. And they owned a rowing boat, a big, big skiff, you know, that would yeah. be about 17 foot long. And they went out every morning at six to, to haul the pots, you know. Yeah. They put them down in the evening, then collect them in the morning. And they always needed what they called a boy, you know, to help them. They would do the rowing. And my brothers used to do that as children, and then I did it. And I learned to be a, a, a very, very good oars person. And so we had this wildness in the nature mm. around us. And mm. the atmosphere of a harbour is always a bit wild. You know, mm. there are always tough characters around mm. there. Mm. So you saw every side of life. And the physicality of rowing and swimming every day, I just loved you know, mm. was just passionate about nature mm, mm. and and so at seven to to lose your dad and to know that actually the worst thing can happen yes the worst thing the worst thing yes. did happen the worst yes. thing did happen yes um such a formative experience it and and shaping your radicalism yes. um and your interaction mm -hmm. you're growing up in in a very very catholic a very catholic world and yes. being very shaped by that yes Yes. Yeah, extraordinary. Well, I got involved in politics very early. I, I, I don't really, I can't really say where the social conscience came from, although two of my brothers, I suppose, had it to some extent too. And my mother, while she was never an activist, my grandmother was a tremendous activist. Ah. Was, and my mother would always say, oh, Granny will never be dead while you're alive. <laughs> 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 granny was a great Republican. What was, interest, what, what, what was, what was uh, Granny interested sorry? in? What was Granny interested in? What was she? Well, she was a Republican, you see. Yeah. And, oh yes, and very active. Mm. And she came, they lived, they grew up in um, Port Leash and Granny left Port Leash in 1916 to came, come down to Dublin. She said she was going shopping, you know, at Easter. <laughs> and people didn't realise for a wow. long time. Oh yes, yes, she was hiding. She was in, in Inya Heron and knew all the great names of the time, you know. They were all her friends because it was a very small world. So she was a feminist and a Republican. And as I was always reminded of Republican as in the sense of uh, Catholic, Protestant and dissenter. It was Wolf Tone's uh, Republicanism. So it wasn't the narrow Catholic first mm -hmm, mm -hmm, of Republicanism, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. She was a very broad-minded person. And she talked about politics when I, all, all her life. And she was absolutely crazy about the theatre. and knew all the figures ah. of the day. From the time my mother was 15, they moved to Bagot Street because... Granny wanted to be part of the action, you know, and she uh, opened a uh, shop there. And uh, she, in her old age, used to hold forth, and that really was what she did mm -hmm. in the Shelburne Hotel. I thought there was a 
brilliant idea, you know. Instead <laughs> of staying at home waiting for people to come in, she'd go into the yeah. Shelburne and everybody knew that's where you met Mrs. Kearsey, you know, if you wanted to see her. And I yeah. used to Mitch from school at that stage <laughs> and drop in to see Granny. And she didn't care at all if I was still in my school uniform. She thought, oh, yeah, a chance to chat to Mary, do you know. So and, she, she was an influence. And, and negotiating or finding, finding your way um, in that kind of wider culture, mm. finding your way, your your sexual identity, realizing that you were lesbian, in in that kind of a world. Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, I'd have to place my mother a little in it because, as I say, she inherited that notion of Catholic Protestant in the center. So she was a person of deep faith. And, of course, we were, you know, absolutely normal church-going Catholics when I was growing up. And my mother didn't know anything about, you know, les certainly not lesbianism. Although, I remember her saying to me, there were quite a few women I knew, elderly women, who lived in couples, you know. Mm. And they always pretended they were sisters. But mm. nobody seemed quite convinced of that. Mm. And I remember asking my mother about a particular couple who were friends of hers. And I remember her saying, it struck me... And I didn't know why it struck me, because I would only have been nine or so. And she said, well, you know, Mary, not every woman likes to marry. There are some women who aren't suited to marriage, and they prefer to live with a companion. Mm. I think it's mm. very interesting. You know? mm. <laughs> and what struck me, I think, at that time was just the notion of anything that was different. I was always looking for the non, the unconventional. Mm. So my mother, while being extremely respectable, was also, it's a difficult mix to describe. She was also extremely broad-minded. She lived in a particular way, but she was extremely unusual in that she could allow other people to be completely different. And she really mm. believed in freedom of conscience. Mm. But nevertheless, when I came out as gay, I thought, this is going one step too far. How old were you? I was, I think I was 23. Yeah have to put it in perspective because um, of course I'd been in love with a girl at school you know as we've all been but I was I, when I was a teenager I thought I was bisexual I was quite sure of that and that was even more confusing because right. you know where was I going to find bisexuals <laughs> and I found I don't think we even had the words for it no we wouldn't have had the words for it and when I was 15 16 I met a charming French man uh, who's four five years older than me and fell in love with him. And I was with him for seven years, going back and forth. I studied in France then when I was 20. And we'd break up and get together again and break up and get together. And the reason we broke up was because I was always conscious that there was something else, there was mm. something missing, do you know? Mm. And I thought about this a great deal because he was a lovely person. And I had another um, male partner too, who I still know very well, a really, really lovely guy. And I could have lived with either of them. And Francois, the French guy, certainly wanted to marry me and constantly asked. And my mother adored him and everybody thought, oh, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. Mary's so lucky now. She's mm -hmm. fallen on her feet, you know, and she men never makes any effort. And here she is now with the perfect young man. And they had such expectations for me. And I went to study, as I said, in Paris Set, Paris Diderot University in Paris. And he was already a lecturer at that stage. And everybody thought, that's Mary settled now, you know, mm -hmm. she'll, she'll calm down, you mm -hmm. know, because Paris will be a big enough stage for her. And after a year or 18 months, I came back again. And it was the first time my mother was really angry with me. She was really disappointed. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, Mary, what are we going to do with you now, you know? Mm -hmm. If this didn't work, what is going to please you? And I was trying to explain what was wrong about it for me. And she said, but there, whatever you do, there'll be difficulties. Everything in life has difficulties and if you're not able to accept the difficulties because I had this purest notion. Anyway, I think a large part of it was that I, I couldn't adapt, I couldn't accept what was offered to me as the female role at that time as wife and mother. Mm -hmm. And because I knew I was really attracted to my own sex, I was extremely conscious that I could fall in love with a woman I could marry Francois and have children mm -hmm. and be v very happy up to a point. And then I had this fear that someday, and of course I was right, someday a woman would walk around the corner 
and I'd fall madly in love with her. And I was afraid I'd leave my children. And I think, I've, really? I've told other women this, I've yeah. told women who have lost, left their children, you know, who have yeah. fallen in love with them. And they say, how could you have known that at that age? Yeah. And why would it have mattered so much? Yeah. And I think it was probably because I'd experienced what it was to lose a parent that I just felt I could okay. never do that. Okay. I could never do that. Okay. And I, at the same time, I couldn't promise that it wouldn't happen, you see. Okay. So I thought, I can't yeah. promise myself to Francois and then, you know, yeah. run out. And I can't be trapped. Yeah. And, and, uh, and maybe there were, so there were, if I have this, so there were kind of, there were two pieces there. There was the, yeah, the, the love, the attraction to, to women. Yes. Um, and a, mm, a not wanting to fall into uh, roles that were expected of women yes. at the time. Yes. Uh, both going on, both going on there for you. Yeah. You, I, 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 came, I came across a, uh, a report of a headline that said, um, I think it was at a debate in UCD in 1970, and um, it said, um, a self-confessed lesbian denounces heterosexuality. Yes, that brought tell, the house down. Tell, <laughs> well, tell me I, about the background. I, I came home from France, you see, sort of in disgrace, you know, and thinking, well, you know, I have to, I have to do something to justify being here. And Ireland was still in the dark ages and having lived in France and having been in other countries, I'd already traveled, I'd already lived in England for a short stage. And I thought, I can't possibly put up with this place. Somebody has to shake it up, you know? And I thought, where can I find some radicals? There must be. And the only name I had uh, as a person who was even radical, never mind feminist or gay, I had no idea she was gay, was Noel McCafferty because I had read her pieces in the Irish Times while I was abroad. So I knew that she was part of the Women's Liberation Group. And I went to their first meeting. And sorry, my first meeting. They, they had been active for a year or two. And I was so disappointed because they were actually discussing marriage on the night that I got there. Mm. For some reason, they were discussing the ins and outs of marriage. And, and I remember Nell saying some extraordinary, God knows why, um, saying, wouldn't we all love the certificate? Wouldn't we all love to be married? You know, wouldn't we all love to walk up the aisle? And I thought, oh my God, you know, yeah. is this women's yeah. liberation? So I thought I have to find gay people somehow. They have to exist. And I've told this story so often, it sounds like something I've just made up, but it actually did happen this way. I was walking up Grafton Street with my girlfriend, Irene Brady, who lives in Paris and is still a really close friend of mine. And we saw on a poster, Sexual Liberation Movement Meets Tonight, Trinity. And I had never, she had never, nobody had ever seen the word sexual written in public in Ireland in large letters. And I said, we're going. <laughs> <laughs> and we had about half an hour before it started. And I, I just knew this is it. This is going to change my life. I didn't know what it was. Oh, I should have said that just before I left Paris, I did meet one of my lecturers was gay and I discovered it just at the end. Right. And she brought me to a big, beautiful, beautiful spectacle, as they used to call them in France, a light show, which was something that didn't happen in Ireland. Yeah, yeah. It was some marvelous building somewhere on the left bank. And uh, I walked into this room and I thought, these are the most beautiful people I've ever seen. Who are these people, you know? And she said, a lot of them are gay and the others are all artists. <laughs> this is my world. I have Your to tribe. find these people somehow. Instantly, I thought, this, this is me. And anyway, so I see this poster and I say to Irene, we're going. And I went to the little room in Trinity, above the stairs as you go in. And here were six wonderful people, two of them leaping around on a table, I remember, two wonderful gay men with a lot of makeup on, you know. <laughs> Hugo McManus, who is still a friend, living in Milan. Mm. many, many years. Mm. And we started almost immediately. We just got down together and they said, you know, what are you? You know, and I said, I don't know what to call myself. I think I'm probably bisexual. And they said, okay, we'll put you down as that, you know. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> they and, needed a bisexual. Yeah, yeah. And denouncing, de denouncing heterosexuality. Tell me about the fallout um, reported in the paper. Yes. You know, the self-declared lesbian. Well, between announcing myself as bisexual to the group, then I decided I, I, I fell in love with a beautiful French woman in the meantime. 
and I had been going to the women's liberation meetings. So somebody, with, I think it was the first women's week of UCD, the first time there had been a women's week festival, you know, that went on for five days with lots of discussion and conferences. And there was an English woman who was to speak and she got ill at the last minute and there was nobody to fill in and somebody said, would you do it, Mary? And I had been a debater at school and, you know, I knew I, knew I could get through a speech all right. And I thought, well, this is my chance, you know, to just shake the place up a bit. And I didn't think I was going to be staying in Ireland. I thought this was, you know, a short, <laughs> a short term thing. <laughs> and I was in love with my lovely French girl and she was sitting in front of me in the front row, yeah. you know. And certainly had to impress her. So there was another, uh, a young man with me, Fergus Martin, who is an artist and is now in Estona too with me. And uh, he was obviously a young gay activist. And I remember him sitting in his beautiful little dungarees looking so innocent. And there was a well-known psychologist sitting uh, who was sort of introducing us. And I think she had no idea that we were gay. She just took it for granted, you know, because we were... People thought, yeah. you know, gay people had hordes. They really did. So I think she was astonished when we stood up mm. and introduced ourselves as gay. But I decided to just go for it, you know. And I wasn't going to make any apologies. You know? I was going to change these people. Mm. The, the, it was their problem. If they couldn't see how beautiful we were, that was their problem. So I do remember saying that, um, of course, very influenced by feminism in the States, which we were all reading then, Kate Millett and so on. And if lesbian is feminism is the theory, lesbianism is the practice. So that was one of the lines, you know. And I did say that uh, heterosexuality, you know, is sadomasochism, you know, and elaborated <laughs> on the point. So the place was packed. It was a room about twice the size, and it was filling up as I was speaking, and the <laughs> shouting was starting within minutes of my standing up. And I really hadn't foreseen that, that the degree of aggression. Mm. I had never faced that before. And it actually wound me up. I was enjoying it because it was mm. like a, a football match, mm. you know? And I didn't think of it as having consequences. That was just yeah. the arena for that night. Yeah. And, and the fallout at, at home, at getting that kind of attention, those kind of headlines, what? Well, it was immense because, you know, I had done it all on impulse and I hadn't prepared my mother. And I had said to the journalist who was sitting in the front row, I didn't know there would be journalists. There weren't usually. And she said, can I cover this? And I said, well, yes. I said, but don't use my second name because we're actually the only ones in the country. Dorsey, it's extremely unusual. There aren't any other Dorseys in Ireland. And she said, oh, no, I won't. So probably she didn't have the last say, you know how it is. The mm. sub-editor changes it. Mm. So the very next day, as you, you probably heard, there was a banner headline on the front page of the Irish Times, self, just as you said, self-confessed lesbian yeah. denounces heterosexuality as sadomasochism, see page seven. <laughs> and I remember sitting with my girlfriend at the time and turning the page and thinking, oh my God, you know, how will we go home to my mother? My mother, the widow, living alone, mm. surrounded by very respectable, you know, conservative mm. neighbours. So it was one of the worst times in my life that, was it? that I went out. We, yeah, I was already living away from home, obviously, mm. but because my mother lived alone and we were tremendously close. She was wonderful. Yeah. We were already wonderful companions, you know, intellectual companions. Mm. We always talked about books and ideas and politics. And she welcomed all my friends to the house mm. and was tremendously generous. But anyway, we went out to see her for Sunday lunch. And she was standing at the sink. And I hadn't really seen her cry since the first few years after my father's death. And the tears were just flowing down her face. And she couldn't speak. I had never seen her. She was a very strong woman, very courageous. And had been through a lot of trouble in her life. She couldn't speak. She couldn't look at me. She couldn't speak. And the tears just kept flowing. And she went on making the dinner. And we sat down on Sunday lunch. And the tears flowed all through the meal. And she didn't speak. We stayed then because we thought we can't leave her on her own. She literally couldn't speak. Oh. It was astonishing. Gosh. And I kept talking, but she didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I don't know if she phoned my sister or if my sister was coming anyway. My sister was living in London and she was cool, sophisticated. She was older than me and she knew some gay people in London, you know. Yeah. 
So she came over and she, she told me afterwards, she said, listen, everybody knows she's gay, mom. I'm sure everybody knows it just because you're such an old fuddy-duddy. You know? yeah. <laughs> You've got to get with the program. Yeah. So that was a helpful mm, approach. Mm, mm. And we drove the sister to the airport after two days. And on our way back, my mother still couldn't speak. And I said, mom, I'm so sorry you found out this way. You know, I'm really sorry I hurt you. And then we began to talk. Oh. And from the moment onwards, then, we began this debate, you know, right. that continued for the rest of our lives. Mm. That she said, in her very quite noble way, she said, well, you can't expect me to understand. Mary is very new to me. And I don't have, you know, the, the information to understand. Mm. But we'll have to talk about it. Mm. Wow, and extraordinary. A wonderful dialogue. Extraordinary. Well, Mary, was there room, so I'm thinking of the kind of, 70s, 80s, I'm thinking about the women's movement. I'm thinking about um, our own membership of what became, what has become the EU. All of those changes that were taking place. Where were lesbian women? What was the room for lesbian women in that? What, what happened to them in all of that? Oh, well, of course, the, the EU began to change things for us. And how I think about it is that the EU forced new legislation on us, but the women's movement and the gay movement prepared the ground. We did the education, we did the consciousness raising okay. that made it possible for Irish people to accept those big legislative changes, do you know? Yeah. And the two worked together. Yeah. And without that, I don't think Ireland could have accepted the, the EU in the way that we did, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I think it's also, it's a factor of Irish society, isn't it? That it's one of the good things about us, that because we're so small, people get educated very quickly. You know, yeah. the news goes round. Yeah. News travels yeah. fast. Yeah. And the early women's movement and the early gay movement, we went round the country from the start, talking in conferences and talking in small groups and most of the time being thrown out and people throwing things at us. Uh, but, you know, the word did, did spread very quickly and people began to debate it very quickly and people began to be... I don't think we were asked onto television until much later. Not Irish people. Mm. You know, there were the two lesbian nuns on the late late and, mm -hmm. you know, it was okay for a foreigner to do it, just about. Le le lesbian nuns on the late late in yes. the mid-80s? Yes. Early, early, yes. early mid-80s. And yes. there, was, there was uproar, wasn't Absolutely, there? Absolutely, yes. But I know that they said they were astonished to find that the next day they walked, you know, up and down Grafton Street and people came flocking to them, shaking their hand right. and thanking them and congratulating mm. them. So there's always that double thing in Ireland, isn't there? Mm, mm, mm. Because so many people, if, you know, even if they didn't have a gay bone in their body, everybody had a secret. Everybody had been forced into secrecy and guilt about something. And that's really what we represented for them. All my life, that has happened to me too since, you know, that first night at UCD. People come up to me continually and say, thank you for speaking out. Yeah. Because that gave me the courage to speak out about whatever it was. Yeah, were. yeah. You, and, and, and going kind of back to your mum a little bit. Um, I mean, a lot of... A lot of your work, at least to, to my ear, my, to, to my hearing, um, is about the, the roles that women um, occupy, play, um, are sometimes forced to mm, play, mm. Um, and, um, and how they transcend, sometimes how they transcend some of, some of those, um, those roles. Yes. And you're... You're not afraid, you're not afraid to say things. You're not afraid to, to, to share those secrets. Um, in a way, Mary, that's terribly, um, I think, very brave. And, and when I read you, and I read, I think of the context, I think of the, the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, um, and, and the bravery required to say some of those things out loud really, really strikes me. Well, it was the dark ages. It's hard to overemphasize that, you know. It was, I mean, the 50s that I grew up in was so grim. Um, 
poor, very little food, you know, places mm -hmm. in Ireland had no electricity or even running water. We used to visit friends in Wicklow who pumped their water, you mm -hmm. know, they didn't, and that was just down the road, so to speak. And they're just simply, unless you were a Protestant, and even then, if you were a Protestant, you had to be ultra respectable. We knew, had a lot of Protestant friends. And uh, no mm. Catholic could afford not to go to Mass, you mm. know, not mm. to be seen to go to Mass. Mm. So you really can't yeah. overemphasize yeah. the level of repression. Yeah. And that yeah. was still, we were still in the grip of that in the yeah. 70s. Yeah. And there was such a strong right-wing movement, you know, when we had protest marches and any kind of um, public meetings, we had eggs thrown at us and roaring and shouting. We were, yeah. you know, hit over the head. We had stones thrown at us. Yeah. We had, uh, when we, as the women's movement used to go, as you know, to the 40 foot, that was one of our, yeah. our campaigns yeah. Yeah. that we all enjoyed. And we were literally stoned. There were gangs of guys waiting for us every time. And for some reason, they loved throwing flour at us. That was one of the things. Fla that they flour. flour. They'd yeah. have bags, big bags of flowers. And they seemed to think this was tremendously terrifying. Mm. You know? mm. Mm. And uh, they would scream abuse mm. at us. Mm. And we would just charge in and throw ourselves into the water. And they, their main problem was that they had to cover up then, because as you know, it was yeah. nude bathing there. And they yeah. Thought, oh, now we're going to have to yeah. cover up. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that extreme yeah. radical, yeah. the extreme right wing conservative yeah. atmosphere was omnipresent. You, so I should say that if none of this would have been possible for me if I hadn't been part of a movement. I mean, if I had been an isolated gay person and if I hadn't had a lover, I don't think I would have done any of this. What might have happened? I don't know, but it, you know, from the moment I fell in love, I thought I'm not going to lie about this. I was so proud of her. I was so happy. I was so thrilled. There was no way in the yeah. world I was going to keep my head down and you know, hide this person. I, I would honestly have rather have died. I'm mm -hmm. quite happy to be shot mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. do that. I just, mm -hmm. that's, it's not in my nature. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I didn't care what anybody thought. Mm -hmm. you know, this is how I feel and this is the person yeah. I love. But, but and from the beginning, that was our attitude. And she was beautiful and extrovert and lovely personality. And people just, you know, couldn't see us in any way yeah. as perverted. They just didn't, yeah. you know. The, Maybe, the, the, all the names just yeah. rolled away from them because it just obviously didn't fit. Can I, can I ask you to read a poem? Yes. <laughs> um, and, and, and maybe one that, that gets to some of, some of what, um, what we're talking about right now. The um, come quietly, the neighbours might hear. Do you, do, do you have that handy? I, I do. Have, I, I have it Would somewhere. you mind reading that for us? It might take me a minute yeah. to get hold of it. Well, yes, that really describes the grim side of Irish life yeah. in that period. And um, I came up to Dublin. I had been living in Kerry. I lived in Kerry for eight years and I ran, a, well, I shouldn't say I ran it, my, this lovely French lover, Garel Dupradal, who uh, was a chef, brilliant chef. She'd grown up, you know, between Ireland and, and Paris and her grandmother ran uh, the Hotel du Nord in Paris. So she literally learned to cook at her grandmother's knee. And then we had lived in America together. We lived in Boston and in Maine and in New York. And she cooked in the restaurants all along the East Coast and, you know, mm. did her train, further training there. So that was her, always her dream. And we went to Kerry and she had been, we had been intending to stay there just a winter. I went down to write and I wanted to be on my own, but she followed me, of course. <laughs> and then the summer came on and she was to go to France that summer. Her mother had a place in the south of France and she was going to go there and open a restaurant in the south of France. But at the last minute it fell through, she couldn't get the money for it or something. And to comfort her, she was devastated. And to comfort her, I brought her into Dingle and I said, look, there's bound to be somewhere. You know, there were already two famous restaurants in Dingle and it was just beginning to grow, mm. beginning to become the Kinsale of Kerry, you know. Mm. And I said, we surely can find one here. So anyway, we did and we stayed and she was there for 10 years. I was there for eight. So I came up one winter to spend the winter in Dublin. And I remember being on, I think it's Herbert Street, just off Baggett Street. And it was grim in the way that flats were then in the old Georgian houses. Mm. And it happened to be full of elderly women 
who would make their way up very slowly up the <laughs> stairs and they all listened to the news at the same time. All their televisions would be on, you'd hear the bong bong of the Angelus and then the awful bad news. And as it happened in the way that Ireland, typically mixed Ireland, you know, my front step for some reason was where all the prostitutes meet, used to meet too and they would be having clients at nine o'clock in the morning and you would have to push past, you know, the girls yeah, yeah. to get out to do your shopping at nine o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So the two worlds were always yeah. in collision. Yeah. And there would be, as you know, this litany of bad news. Yeah. with the sort of black, black emotions that so many Irish people have and they love. Yeah. I call it the sacred news because so many people have to watch the six o'clock <laughs> news, you know. And they seem to have this <laughs> ghoulish love. So my lover would come to visit me there and... It's come quietly or the neighbours will hear. It's a very long poem, so well, I'll just begin Even it. some of it. Have you ever made love with the TV on to spare the neighbours, landlady lord, the embarrassment, the joy undisguised of two people, especially women, imagine the uproar coming together. Come quietly or the neighbours will hear. That year was the worst, an aching winter of it, small mines and towns, rented rooms and narrow beds, walled in by other people's decencies. And at every sitting down to table, broadcast at breakfast, dinner and tea, the daily ration of obscenity. Have you ever made love with the TV on? Come quietly or the neighbours will hear. <laughs> Beautiful. So that Thank does you. capture, yeah. it explains also the sort of uh, passionate rebellion I had because mm. it was a country of horrors. There was so much suffering and mm. so much sin, you know, mm. Mm. and so much shame and secrecy. Mm. And in the women's movement, we discovered it long before others because people came to us right from the mm. beginning mm. and we knew about child abuse before mm. other people did mm. and we knew about priests sleeping with their housekeepers and having children mm. and sending them into orphanages and we knew about people brought up in orphanages who'd had to give up their yeah. children. We knew all these tragic stories. Yeah. Yeah. Women would come every week. This was Irish Women yes. United and yeah. they would come to the Sunday meeting and they would sit in the back of the room sobbing and one mm. after another would tell her story, thinking she was the only one in the yeah, country. Yeah. And then the others, you know, would mm. say, that's my story. Mm. You, in addressing those issues, you, um, there's a, a, a tenacity um, in, your, in your voice, uh, in your writing, in your, yes. in your writing voice. Um, but, but I've also, there's an emotional uh, tenacity, an emotional... Um, and directness that I've been um, really taken by in reading your work over the last number of weeks in particular, preparing for today. Um, and, and there's a, a, a poem, um, a parting. Um, I, think, I hope I have it yes, right. Yes, I'm sure you parting. do. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, really, that really stopped me in my tracks. And um, I'm told that... Um, I should never read um, a poet's poems to them, but if you if you don't mind, can I read a couple? Oh, this is the one to, for my mother. Yeah. So, yes, so to, it's an is, unusual poem, and it is actually, unlike many poems, it's it's directly from experience. Usually, they're a combination of, you know, imaginative experience. Mm. Sometimes other people's. You're not always writing about yourself. You can write in the first person and use it as a device, you know, mm. to tell somebody else's story. But in this case, mm. this is how it happened, parting. Do you, do you mind if I read a little no, bit of that? No, no, I'd love it. Badly, please. I'm sure. Please, I'll read no, it badly. please do. <clears throat> and, 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 and so this is, this is your mom, this is about your mom, the woman yes. we, we, yes. We, we've spoken yes. quite a bit about. Yes, and she's 93. She's 93. I had never found you not ready to talk. So I took the family photographs down from the shelf behind, behind you where I had set them 12 months before. And I said aloud all the names of your children, one by one, 
coming last to my own. The youngest, I said. You thought that was funny. You smiled without moving your lips. I told you where each one was living, which one might get here in time and which one might not. You listened without the least show of surprise. Then I said the names of your mother, your father, your six dead siblings. They are expecting you. I've sent word. They will have everything ready. You smiled. I asked if you were thirsty and you said yes. But when I held the plastic beaker to your mouth, the juice ran everywhere, staining the front of your new bed jacket. We need more practice at this, I said. We'd better start quickly then, you replied. Um, Thank you. I've never heard somebody else read it. Your, to, to your mum in the last in the last weeks of, of her life. It was it was her last day. It was actually the last day. I was living out of Dublin, and she, of course, her memory was fading. You know, for, for many years, and I was the main carer, not the only one. My sister was living abroad, and two of my brothers. And so it was it was a heavy burden in in, in sense of time commitment and so on. But because we were so close, and we had really a, a remarkable way of uh, communicating. I think even from childhood we'd had, but we'd had to develop it because she had had such a difficult journey. Mm -hmm. I, I should have said that when I came out, she immediately after that report in the Irish Times, she had uh, vile abuse, people bringing her up, and actual death threats and appalling insult and abuse. She had death and, Death yes. Threats, oh, yes. Yes. And at least half the town turned their back on her. And she didn't tell me this for a long time. People just stopped talking to her. And the, the, the family, their, their cousins and aunts, uncles and aunts who didn't speak to her or didn't talk about me again for years. A favourite aunt who was also her favourite sister. And she told me years later that that aunt never mentioned my name again. So that was a tremendous... God. burden for her to carry and she had a choice I think either to reject me or to accept me and and change with me and we kind of agreed to do mm. that together and she had you know remarkable courage and she had a tremendous pride and she had a way when she was going through something very difficult of just lifting her head you know she'd bow down at first you'd see the sorrow and then she'd lift her head and she'd go, right we're going to handle this you know mm. So she was tremendously uh, welcoming of all my friends and always had my partners to the house and the neighbours didn't, <laughs> didn't really approve of that. It was years before she had a neighbour who thought I was a good idea, you know, and who thought that my books were something to be proud of. Mm -hmm. So anyway, by the time she was in her old age, we moved into a new stage of remarkable communication. And as she was losing her memory, I was kind of became her memory. Mm -hmm. And we had this sort of game we'd play where I'd prompt her, I'd ring her and she'd say, hello, and she'd say, it's very kind of you to ring. And who is this? Do you mind my asking who this is, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'd say, do you want the facts about you, mom? And she'd say, oh, that would be very helpful. And I'd go through the facts, you know, from her early days and her, her own family and then her, her children. And at the end of it all, she'd say, oh, thank you so much, Mary. That's wonderful. But on one wonderful occasion, I remember her saying, thank you so much for telling me all this. And would you mind telling me, how is this? You know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so oh. we moved, you know, in and out of that kind of rationality. She could be completely rational and some yeah. things she never forgot and then other things would be gone completely. So by the time she was in the nursing home, I suppose half of her intelligence was gone, but she could still connect at a very deep level and um, she knew she was dying. There was no doubt about that. Anyway, I was in Kilkenny and I used to ring twice a day and I rang that morning, it was Saturday morning, 
And I spoke to the, the matron and she said, oh, she's in great form. She's going nowhere. She's just a little bit tired. She's a little bit of a cold. And she said, but the doctor was in this morning to see her. I called the doctor and I said, well, I'll, I'll just bring the doctor myself, I think. And I spoke to the doctor and it was a bank holiday weekend. And she said, oh, she's perfect, Mary. I'll come back in on Tuesday. And she said, she's in very good form. It's nothing more than a cold. And she is as always smiling, she said. Mm-hmm. And I put down the phone and I thought, she's not. She's dying. I don't know how I knew that. And my partner was to come down that weekend and I just phoned her and said, don't come. I'm driving up to Dublin. And I got into the phone, straight into the phone, uh, into the car and drove up to Dublin. It was, you know, a two and a half hour journey and raced to the nursing home and opened the door and my mother was sitting up like a queen, you know, beautifully dressed and with her hair swept back, looking perfect. And I looked at her and knew she was dying. I don't know how I knew. And I thought, why does nobody else know she's dying? It's perfectly obvious mm-hmm. she's dying. Mm-hmm. And the only change was a bruising under her face, which I know actually is, you know, one of the signs of heart mm-hmm. failure. The blood isn't getting to the head anymore. Mm-hmm. And she was sitting, after a few minutes I realized, mm-hmm. she was looking as if she was holding something very fragile in her hand and she had to keep absolutely still maybe balancing something like cut glass you know Mm. on her head because she looked as if she couldn't afford to move and it was her own life she was balancing and she must have felt the tide of 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 death rising in her but she was smiling and totally unafraid yeah and she had an air a beautiful air of expectancy Mm. And she was always a little bit nervous. She, she was a cancer person, mm. you know, astrology, and loved her home. And you had to dig her out of her mm-hmm. home. Mm-hmm. But she did like to go and visit other people mm. and she liked to travel. But there was always a bit of nervousness when the, the suitcases were packed. She'd be a little bit of flutter, you know, afraid of missing the plane, that kind of thing. And oh, now are we late, you know. And that's how she was. Yeah. It was that little nervousness, yeah. but expectation. Yeah. And in, in fact, I think you, maybe you use that line that she, um, she never liked de- leaving or she never liked departures. Yes. yes. Um, and maybe that's in the parting too. Yes. The, the, the language, I mean, the language, um, the words that you use, um, the words that poetry, you use in your poetry, Mm. allows you to say things that maybe are hard to hear. Some people would find hard to hear. Yes, yes. And there's a, there's a precision in, in, in your words. That um, I was reminded a little bit of um, the poet David White, who, who um, trained as a scientist, as a biologist, and he said that he left science for poetry because the, the language of science wasn't precise oh, enough. Oh, that's lovely. That's lovely. Yeah. But I, I, and I hear that in, in, in the language that you use um, about things that are hard for us to talk about. Yes, that is the sh- struggle for me when I'm writing. It is the most challenging part. And I had an example of that just the other day because a friend of mine, husband died very suddenly. And I, I was so moved by her situation because she's at the moment in poor health herself. And I, I sat down to write to her and instead I wrote a poem and it took two days. And it was about their relationship to celebrate their love. And I was trying to tell somebody else about it, the journey. And it is that you have to go right into that emotion yourself to say something truthful. You have to empathize totally as if it were happening to you. Mm. Or this is how I experience mm-hmm. it. And it isn't until you get really to the depth of the experience that you can find the words find themselves. And one of my examples is that, you know, when somebody is on the news and they'll be giving an interview about something very hard that's happened to them and they're quite calm and their voice yeah. is quite smooth. And then the interviewer says something that isn't particularly, you know, uh, harsh. Yeah. But suddenly they catch this catch in the voice and tears will flow down their face because one word has pierced through to the heart. One word holds all the pain. 
And very often when you're trying to write about suffering, you have to find what that word is. And it does, it's, it is a strange kind of alchemy because it does carry the pain to other people. Mm. And, and we, in, a, in a world where there is a tendency towards fundamentalism, towards kind of dichotomized views of right and wrong and, and uh, fundamentalism, your, your words are, are, are poetry is a, an antidote um, yes. In some ways, I think, yeah. um, and 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 maybe that's where it kind of fits or or, or speaks to issues of equality, mm. diversity, and inclusion, yeah. um, because it's it rests somewhere in in the middle in the in the non-binary. Does that make any does that make any sense? It does, yes. Because to go back to the past again, when I was in the height of, or the depths of my activism. <laughs> and, you know, just a very small group of us and we maybe 10 who could take the, the risk of being, you know, open about our position, even about contraception or abortion, never mind lesbian or gay rights, yeah. you know. But we would go to small, you know, town halls and, and small meetings and half the time either nobody came or they, you know, they just hurled abuse at us and we had to leave. But very quickly, when I, I had begun to write, I had always written, I should say, I've always written poetry and always written stories, but I wasn't thinking of publishing until the 70s. And occasionally I would read a poem in one of these groups. And I found very quickly that it just stopped the abuse. People who had come to me oh. all furious, you know, and mm. had the eggs ready in their yeah. basket, would just stop and look really, really puzzled. And off, often would have tears in their eyes and would come up afterwards yeah. and say, I didn't want to like you, you yeah. know, I didn't expect to agree with you and don't think I do yeah. agree with you. I don't agree with you. I think that's criminal what you're doing. But what you said there about, and I saw it pierced. It got through to them. Yeah. I, and, and Mary, I think that's so, gosh, I think that's so important. Um, and again, Maybe it was, um, um, oh, I can't remember who said it, but that poetry is a language that we have no defences yeah. uh, against. We, we, it, it gets kind of, it gets behind our, yes. our, our, yes. our defences. Yes. Um, and, and, and particularly pertinent um, when it comes to issues that you've fought for all of your life for, for equality and and justice and diversity. Language, the, the poetry being the kind of, I want to say the back door, and I don't mean it that way, but... Yes. Yeah, the way in. Yes, if you get it right, and you get a <laughs> poem right, that's what it can do. Yeah. And as I say, I did learn that, and not that activism isn't just as important as ever, but it does tend to push people into their own side. People rarely change, yeah. certainly not at a meeting or, or you know, a one-to-one. -one. People do very often become even more entrenched, as you know yourself and whatever their viewpoint is. Whereas if they listen to poetry, yeah. it, does, it yeah. does reach the heart yeah. and it exposes them. It opens up something that they can't resist. Yeah. You, I, I think you've said uh, elsewhere that uh, po poetry is a is a political act. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I might well have said yeah. that. Um, and my partner, Ursula Halligan, who's very involved in, and a journalist, and very involved in campaigning at the moment for reform in the Catholic Church. She's a very passionate feminist. And she has discovered that too, that when she uses poetry, mm people can hear in a way that they mightn't otherwise. Mm. She's discovered mm. that very often. Yeah. That that too reaches even very conservative people yeah. Yeah. who have closed minds. Yeah, yeah. It can open open hearts, It uh, changing hearts and minds. Yes, yes. Um, and is such, just a, such an antidote to our, um, sometimes our public discourse Mm. That's so dichotomized. Mm. Yes, yes. That's that's so binary. Yes. Um, and 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 through poetry, we can find ourselves. We find that we can, as you yes. say, if it's done well, yes. we can find the common yes. ground. 
yeah. the the, yeah. the middle ground, the middle yeah. way. Yeah. Mary, it's been an absolute um, pleasure to to have this conversation with you this morning. Um, from from our colleagues in UCD in equality, diversity, and inclusion, uh, and from our colleagues and friends here in in Mali, our, our heartfelt thanks to you for your your honest sharing of your work and your life. Um, thank you. Thank so you, much. Paul. It's really been a pleasure, a pleasure and a privilege. Thank so you. thank you for inviting me. Thank you and very I'm delighted much. to be part of it. Thank you very much. For me, literature, for me, writers, for me, the, the, the arts, in, in some ways, um, capture, capture what's often um, missed in conversation, what's often missed um, um, historically when it comes to the lives of people um, who, for various reasons in, in this country and beyond, don't experience an equal world, uh, a world that is accommodating, is embracing of diversity, and certainly a world that isn't inclusive. So uh, I, I, I feel the arts uh, and, and literature play a very, very central and important role in, in, in advocating for um, a more equal, a more just, a more diverse and inclusive society.